Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for your time today. My name is Taha Kashut. I'm a senior leader at Amazon, focused on healthcare and AI-related initiatives, including the Amazon Comprehend Medical that we're going to be discussing today. Um, a great opportunity here. Um, we hope to kind of have a little bit deep dive with you guys today and also get the opportunity to listen to our, some of our customers. Um, one thing really important, over the last decade here in the United States and globally, there's been quite adoption of electronic health records. Basically, your records are now digitized uh, as opposed to these reams of papers that we all had to carry around from one place to another. Now, if you're trying to kind of, as you do with any kind of data, be able to extract uh, insights and actionable uh, information, um, well, you need to have access to structured data. While the electronic medical record holds quite a bit of that uh, structured data, um, unfortunately, the, the action that you really need to make oftentimes is missing from those structured fields. And oftentimes, the treasure is within the unstructured part of the records. Uh, the unstructured part of the record, that's the most part of the record. This is basically when you have an encounter with the healthcare system, is uh, with the patient and the doctor or the caregiver, oftentimes documenting that experience or when you transfer from one place to another, that record sort of an experience tra traveled with you um, and it, uh, has a lot of information about your medical conditions, but the history of, uh, of your uh, condition or those of your family as well as the medications you're on or you stopped. Along, along with other nuances that might be related to this, for example, this drug might be related to this condition or uh, this medication might have been stopped in the past, but there's some other information about it that might be uh, relevant to, the, uh, to you and, and, and so on. Uh, and the, the, the challenge has been, as you use uh, natural language processing, for, for those of us who have been in the field for a long time, this experience about how you uh, capture this information is, is quite broad and complex that you cannot really capture it with uh, simple rules. So, so oftentimes, there's a lot of manual effort that goes into capturing this information. And this is really where the learning part is very, very important as you learn from many, many um, uh, interactions and encounters as you look at the variety of these medical notes, whether it's from your primary care doc or whether it's someone in the hospital or in ICU or um, related to um, pathology or related to x-ray or related to um, a triage note. So be able to kind of capture all that in, in, in the ways that you can build something, can extract that information structure it in meaningful ways so you can start deriving these number of use cases that you're gonna hear about from our customers uh, today. Some of these use cases, as, as you'll hear from Fred Hutchinson, research, a research institution, is about how can I match a patient with the right um, uh, uh, the right medication to a new therapy that might be more beneficial to them. As, I, as you'll hear also today from Roche, about how can I look at the longitudinal health journey of an individual and be able then to stitch all these together and aggregate so I can have a better picture about the population that I'm, uh, that I'm evaluating. And then how can you be able to do this at scale with regards to accuracy? with regards to volume, as well as regards to uh, a wide breadth of things that you can extract from these medical notes. So um, uh, with that is um, uh, some of the, the things that we've been hearing from our customers are quite uh, varied. I mean, some of these customers are hospital systems and healthcare providers that are looking at how can I identify patients that might be at risk of a treatment or might benefit from a different treatment or from insurers and billers uh, and coders that are looking at, did I capture all the treatments and procedures accurately so I can bill for them accurately and be able to uh, do this across the entire record? Um, or as you look at pharmaceutical in uh, industry to find uh, recruitment of patients into the right clinical trials that's accurate uh, and, um, and, uh, and, 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 and precise. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you now to uh, the most honorable, uh, Mr. Arun Ravi, who's uh, been the product manager for Comprehend Medical, who's gonna introduce you uh, to the service and start diving deep as well as introduce you to the customer. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, thanks. Thanks, uh, really happy to be here and excited to talk about what we built with Amazon Comprehend Medical. Um, so Amazon Comprehend Medical is a new HIPAA eligible service that uses machine learning to extract medical information with high accuracy, reducing the cost, time, and effort of processing large amounts of unstructured medical text. So the way that, you know, I kind of want to take the next uh, 20 to 30 minutes is, you know, 
again, reiterate the customer problem, really focus on what we're trying to solve. You know, what is the service? What does it do? We've taken a lot of thought and effort in really putting the right features together, together to give the output that we think will give customers the most benefit. Secondly, like where can you use this? Um, we see this as a really interesting service where you can consume it in so many different ways. It fits with existing applications, it can help you build newer applications, and have uh, two of our great customers come on stage and talk about some of the things that Taha mentioned. And you know, I usually like to end with a call to action, essentially like what we would like to see, what feedback we would like to have from customers, and how we believe we can take this further. So again, drilling down on this, 1.2 billion unstructured clinical documents are created per year, according to the HIMSS Health Story Project. Um, all documents are not created equally. Uh, size varies, oncology you may have longer notes, you may have admission notes, SOAP notes. There's such a huge variety of data that's actually created. And in that, there's so much critical information that's actually trapped in these documents. Even if you just take a step back and try to get the insight out of you know, a discharge note, how do you do that at scale? How do you do that consistently? And how do you do that in an accuracy that actually helps your applications as you build on it? And these are problems that where, honestly, they're not going away. If you look at it, there's more data being created. And a lot of retrospective look at data is based on billing data, not actually on patient data. So in the end, patient data is actually the source of truth. And that's what we want to kind of unlock with our customers so they can see what more they can do with their applications. So looking at what uh, we, we've launched, we have two APIs. The first is the NERE API and then the PHID API. So we have five entities or categories that we extract. And each of these entities will have subtypes as well. And I'll talk about how we kind of tie that in. So we have medication, medical condition, test treatments, procedures, anatomy, and PHI, protected health information. Now, once you extract it, okay, that's cool, that helps. Now, how do you tie in the related entities to, together? So medication could have dosage, uh, router mode, strength, frequency. So we do something very unique once we extract these entities and it's relation, ex relationship extraction. So we basically tie medication to dosage. An example could be test and result, and there are many more because there's different subtypes that are associated with medication and uh, with test treatments and procedures. And those are the two entities that we actually do that for. But we don't stop there because we realize there's a context in the note. And there's a lot of that that we're trying to surface through something we're calling entity traits. So an example of an entity trait is negation that we're, we've launched with. So negation is, you know, patient denies taking this medication. Um, and I have a few examples. And negation is not just, you know, denies or not taking. There are variables around that. And we're very happy with kind of the accuracy and the results that we're getting to kind of provide that to customers in an easy to consume format. Um, then the second one is uh, whether it's a diagnosis, sign, or symptom. So again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about it and what the differentiation is. But being able to understand that is extremely critical in building smarter applications. And I guess you know, what I'd like you guys to take away from this, if anything, is like we want to distill a complex process into a very sim simple API call. Um, also to add, you know, the service is HIPAA eligible and it's stateless, which means that we actually don't store any customer data that flows through the service by default. So no training will be done on any data that flows through the service. Um, the Second API is the PHID API, and that is just extracting PHI. And the reason we separated it is because there's a lot of compliance, data security, data privacy use cases that we like, um, that our customers have come to us and said, this, we would like to do this at scale. And so we felt it was appropriate to provide it as a separate API. So let's, let's go step by step. So I explained what you know, the API actually does. Let's see how it goes from one end to another. So let's start with the entity. So there's simple text there. Uh, Mr. Smith is a 63-year-old gentleman with coronary artery disease and hypertension, current medications, taking a dose of Lipitor, 20 milligrams once daily. So let's start with the extraction part. So we extract you know, PHI, the name, the age. We have anatomy, which is coronary artery. So that's a system organ site. If you look at medical condition, coronary artery disease is a diagnosis name. Hypertension is a diagnosis name. And medication, Lipitor, we look at the dosage, which is 20 milligrams, and the frequency, that's one daily. As you can see also in the API structure, like basically CLI command is really easy to use. I mean, it is, it, is, it is very easy for you to run this. And when I do the demo of kind of the JSON output, you'll see how we put a little more thought into it to make the output of the API usable right away. Um, and that's something we really focused on um, and now and in the future as well as we keep um, iterating on this product. Now, moving on to the next step. So the next step is relationship extraction. So let's take a subset of that and look at it. So when you take current medications, you know, taking a dose of Lipitor, 20 milligrams once daily, now what we do is we actually tie the once daily and the dosage to the brand name, which is here, Lipitor. And we do the same thing for test treatments and procedures. So you could have a certain test and you have a result. We actually tie the result to the test. 
And in the JSON output, which I'll show a little later, we actually nest it within that actual parent category. So the advantage is that it's literally, if you take it and put it into a database, you can sift and sort immediately. And those are some uh, kind of minor changes that we've done that we think will really enhance customers not only using this in current applications, but building on it as well. Now, entity traits. So let's, let's go and you know, kind of just say, what is an entity trait? It's more contextual information about what has been extracted. Um, the ones that we have at launch are negation. So if, as you can see in the example here, which is you know, discontinue as an example, denies taking, not taking, stopped. There's a variety of different ways that actually uh, clinicians um, document this. And we had to make sure that we covered a wide variety of that to show that, OK, this is actually negated. And that information is extremely important, especially when, you know, as Taha talked about earlier, some of the use cases, when you're looking at patient history, when you're looking over a long timeline, this is actually critical information. Even when you get into cl clinical trial recruitment, you need to know what medication. They may have taken Avastin. Now they've stopped. There's different things that come into understanding what the patient is taking at any given point in time over a period of time that is, is critical to capture. And we're able to do that with, uh, with Comprehend Medical. Now, when you go into uh, diagnosis, sign, or symptom, so the reason why you know, the differentiation is that you know, a symptom is something that's patient-reported. A sign is uh, physician-reported. And a diagnosis is the cause of the results of the symptoms. And that could be you know, through physical findings, uh, lab reports, radiology reports. So in the end, there, this is a differentiation. It's very important to know that. You may want to create an application that just pulls all the self-reported um, outcomes from a patient versus what is physician reported. So there's different ways that you can now actually sift and sort through that data, which we believe is, is really um, useful um, for, for, again, a lot of the applications that we're seeing. So with, with the PHID API, again, it's a very uh, straightforward API. It extracts PHI. And what we've done is, so the NERE API also does extract PHI. So you get, you get it with that, but we've also separated it so that it just focuses on this, on this model, on uh, this extraction. And as you can see here, we, not, not just, we don't extract PHI or tell you there's PHI, we actually identify it. And we're doing it by the relevant patient identifiers as described in the HIPAA safe harbor method of de-identification. And as you can see in this example, we, um, you know, it, it actually tells you what the subtype, so name, age, address, uh, you know, teacher, for example. So, I, it, you know, it's kind of a modification of, of the previous example, but he currently lives in Seattle and works as a teacher. His PCP, Dr. John, you know, works at the University of Washington. And so essentially, we, you know, again, capture the name and uh, capture the University of Washington as an address. And, and, and this we see as a really important use case. And I'll, I'll jump into the use cases later and talk about where we see our customers using this and where we believe that it can go as well. Um, but being able to do this at scale provides something um, easily deployable, um, you know, whether it's HL7 messages or, or anything that's going between different healthcare systems or within a, an existing system between different hospitals, there are easy ways to deploy this. And we see a lot of our customers um, excited about it and what they can do because this has been traditionally a very manual process. So I'm just going to switch into the demo quickly. So this is the live console. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but you know, we're pretty excited about how we've actually represented this information because more importantly than just returning an output, we want to make sure that you guys can actually see the relationships. You can see what we're extracting and, and understand that visually because in, in the end, uh, really trying to break out these notes and put them into applications, you have to really understand how the, how the service works before doing that. So this is a, this is a de identified clinical note and um, basically you know, pretty, pretty straightforward and let's, um, Analyze it. And so these are the insights. So let's, let's kind of deep dive into this. So now you can see here we, we pull the, the age and the profession. And this is from, you know, uh, this is PHI. We have um, sleeping trouble, which is a, a symptom. So it's under, it's under um, diagnosis, medical condition, but it's, uh, it's labeled as a symptom. You can also see that how we capture um, other Again, symptoms here and uh, with the system organ site, with you have face, like slightly. And we also kind of separate it to make sure it's easy to read because, again, you know, clinical notes tend to be very dense. And so it's important to really show those relationships in a unique way. 
Now, if you, if you look down, I like, I like focusing on relationship extraction because the extraction is one part, but really being able to relate these entities is, is critical because in the end, it allows for a lot more structured queries. In the end, if you, know, if you want to search for how many of my patients are taking a certain dosage or how many patients are taking a certain dosage at a certain frequency, that those are things that are actually extremely valuable. And in the end, you can do those searches right off the bat. And we, we, we really see that important for a lot of the use cases we talked about, and, but clinical decision support we feel is something where this can impact immediately. And, and just being able to do this in one API, we see that as um, kind of a, a lot of value that we're providing to our customers. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> So if you look at the, uh, let's go into Vyvanse, the medication. So if you look here, so Vyvanse is the medication, 50 milligrams, you know, the router mode, and then you have at breakfast daily. So what we do is we basically tie that through relationship extraction. And in, in the end, um, you know, kind of what I was talking about, you know, it, it gets complicated. A lot, of, a lot of medications have just different ways that they're being represented. Um, and the fact that we're able to catch this at high accuracy is, is um, you know, is kudos to the team and being able to really do that. But I think it also kind of ties in with uh, working backwards from the customers well. Um, and and we, we do that for, you know, test treatments and procedures as well. And there's not an example here, but essentially you can get, if, you know, you have temperature, weight, and you have the actual results, it's tied to that. So if, if there are notes that may have multiple, uh, you know, you can be taking many medications. You look at patients with chronic conditions taking multiple medications, or you look at patients uh, that are taking, uh, you know, a depression drug and going through a chronic disease. There's just so, such variability between the conditions that patients are going through, being able to separate that, and it gets much more complex. And that's the thing that we're really trying to break down in, in a simple to see UI. Um, as you can see here, again, when you look through the note, there's just different. And, and we've identified all the other um, kind of entities under it. So you can, you can see basically what's covered. So lungs would be a system organ site, but lungs clear. You know, which, could, which is a, a medical condition, a diagnosis. And so in the, in the end, we capture it in a way that's, that's, that's really relevant. And you know, when I get into the JSON output, I like showing that part to customers because it's just, we, we, we really have made it very simple. And, and you know, I recommend you guys try it right away because it's just really simple and you can use it off the bat. So it's not gonna require you know, all the, you know, the ML training that you, know, you would need to do this. And you can literally do those applications or do those searches right away. So I definitely recommend you guys look into it as soon as possible. But you know, we also help sort it. And sometimes viewing this in, in kind of a list view also makes sense in relation to what's being extracted. And so for example, let's go into Vyvanse again. So this is uh, the, the brand name. And if you open it, we have a drop down of all the entities that were extracted. Uh, but again, this is relationship extraction. So yeah, the category is medication, but it is tied to, tied to Vyvanse. And then again, we do that for clonidine as well. And again, this is just a very quick way for, uh, for customers to, to really view um, what we've done. Going back, I actually want to go back up and pick up negation. So here we have, like, for example, no um, oropharyngeal uh, lesion. And so basically it is you know, a diagnosis name and it's negation. So that's important. It's, we've, we've, uh, rec we've recognized it as a diagnosis, but we're saying no, so it's negated, right? So how do we actually, you know, so as you can see here, so here's the entity that was extracted with the score. So we also do provide a confidence score. And the reason that's important is that we want to make sure that you also see the fidelity in the data and maybe push you know, with the, the data where the confidence score isn't high enough, either please give us feedback or at the same time, like, you can actually push that every application or you know, have, have some sort of uh, kind of uh, look into it to make sure that it fits your need. But if you look here in, in terms of the negation, so this is where you know, we put the traits on the right-hand side. And you can see here that you know, the negation score is you know, as a sign. So first of all, it's a sign versus a symptom or diagnosis and that it's negated. So it's a fairly, you know, high score. So we provide this that where in, in any of these uh, extracted kind of diagnosis, you have this extra information to actually put it in context. And that's something that, you know, again, really important um, in, in healthcare in general. Now, this is the JSON output, so let's, let's look into this. Um, so pr pretty straightforward, you know, there's an ID, there's an offset, so where it's located in the document, we actually have the score, the text, the category, and the type. And so this is where the traits would be. So let's jump into some of those examples um, that I was just talking about earlier. Um, just to kind of see how it's represented here. So here we have the medication. So if you look at Vyvanse, then you, know, you have the category, you have the brand name, 
And we've, in the attributes, we've actually, in the traits, we've basically nested this output. So you can actually see what's related here. And again, each, each attribute would ha will have its own kind of structure. But again, you know, we, the type and the score and the relationship score. So we also provide how confident we are that there is a relationship between these two entities. So there's different ways that you can actually sort through this data to see if it's actually relevant. And so that, that is extremely valuable. Um, again, moving on, because you know, there's different things that we're doing, right? We're trying to do, we're not just extracting, we're not just doing relationship, we're also trying to make sure that the entity traits are there. How do we make sure that we provide this in an easy consume format so you can actually sift through it? And this is, this is a great way of uh, being able to do it, especially when it's nested, because it's in relation to actually what, uh, what the parent category is. Moving down, I mean, same thing with clonidine. And again, you can see this here, um, where we nest it here. And, and you, may have, you may have negation to uh, like a non-nested entity as well. So you know, for example, um, here with this, uh, with uh, boogie interior turbinates, you can see that you know, it's a sign. And here's the confidence score as well. So we do it with the individual entities as well. It's not just something that exists with relationship extraction. It's, a, it's across you know, the entities that we, um, that we extract. Um, for the, in this case, it's medical condition. All right, with that, I am going to switch back to the presentation. So I like focusing on use cases. How are customers actually using this? And so you know, I'll deep dive into a few of them. And some of them will capture uh, you know, some of the issues you see in healthcare and, and where we can help accelerate. But at the same time, NLP currently in a lot of these systems is, is kind of built in a way that is not easy to deploy across various products in your organization and in any organization. And in the end, that's something we really want to address in a way that we feel can not just help you um, kind of extend the NLP you may have currently that you're using, but maybe in some ways allow you to build something new. So patient and population health analytics, uh, for example, and I'll, I'll deep dive into a particular use case that I like. It's, it's, yeah, it's fairly broad, right? And, but in the end, you know, let's take clinical decision support out of that, right? Now, how do you, how do, you do anything that works across a hospital, right? How do you do something that can create that single lens? So then that's an example of something that works right off the bat, right? Now, revenue cycle management. Again, revenue cycle is a very long process. There's, you know, you, you have to look at insurance, you have to do coding, you have to do claims management, you have to work with insurer. There's different aspects of that. But medical coding is an extremely difficult part. It's become extremely siloed as well, where you will have coders that are very good at cardiology. You'll have coders that are very good at oncology. How do you actually work across that? And that's something that we really think thoughtfully, think thoughtfully about because in the end, you know, if the more, they're stretched, they're working tons of shifts, uh, hospitals are three to six months behind on, on their coding uh, tasks. Like how do we help not, not, you know, obviously not replace, but give them a superpower. That's the way I look at it. Like how do I give them a superpower to be more efficient? How can I let them do their job better? Can I really support that? Because we, we all know, especially if you're in the, in the space, everyone's getting burned out. There's, there's just too much going on. We really need to help them you know, be more effective. And we see this, that's what we see the solution fitting in as. Now, pharmacovigilance, essentially, you know, tracking a drug post-launch, uh, post, uh, extremely important. There's a lot of uh, factors in there. But I'll talk a little bit about how much information and where it actually comes from. And a lot of it's in text. So how do you go through that? Um, PHI compliance, the use case I've talked about a lot, but like, there's a lot of um, information flowing through different systems. How do you keep track of it? I mean, in the end, just telling you there's PHI there is not useful. You actually need to tell them what sort of PHI is there. And then is there, is there ways that you can do more processing on it? Does this help accelerate your move to the cloud you know, with this information? There's so many things that you can do that if, if you can really identify that at high accuracy. Now, clinical trial management, again, is management is a, is a broad term. I mean, there's, uh, you know, three phases, uh, four if you take two A, two B, but there's, you know, four phases that you need to go through, and the patient population increases. So the amount of documentation per phase increases. How are you keeping track of that? A lot of that's unstructured. So in the end, there's so many of these different areas that, that need NLP and where it's really unstructured. What, you know, what can we do to help? What can we do to accelerate? And that's really kind of the way that we're approaching it. But I like putting what else, because what else? I mean, what else can you do now that you have, you know, and, and uh, a service that you can deploy at ease with you know, the accuracy and the scalability, the pay-as-you-go approach that you expect out of an AWS or Amazon service. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the use cases. And I, I like some of, uh, some of these use cases because they talk about 
not, not necessarily the difficulties of, of healthcare, but the difficulties that physicians and providers and clinicians and nurses and lab techs are actually going through. And, and, and that's something we really want to want to help with. And we feel like a lot of our customers can help with that as well. So again, unstructured data is extremely difficult to mine. Um, you know, clinical team. So if you just look at, you know, a patient coming into the ER, going into the ICU, going into the general ward. Let's take that workflow, right? Now you have 120 clinical decisions made per day in the ICU. They usually work in two shifts, right? 12 hour shifts, sometimes they're eight hours, really depends. Now, how do teams actually transfer information? Now, they're trying to capture this through progress notes. They really are. They're trying to do, whether they're using ASR, whether they're using speech to text, or whether they're documenting it, they're really trying to document this. But the problem is that once, maybe within the ICU you have control, but if you're you know, at the ICU of a Beth Israel, it's, you know, it's gonna be kind of crazy. Now, how do you do that, right? But the second thing is that, how do you make sure this follows the patient? You know, that's kind of critical. When you're in the ICU or when you're in the ER, there are decisions being made in a split second. And it's through the training of these great clinicians that they're able to do that. How do you capture that for someone downstream? I mean, those things are extremely important. So in the end, can you create a single lens for your patient when they initially come in to when they're discharged? Is that single lens useful? Extremely useful when you're in the hospital, but how about after, right? How do you keep track of a patient as they go through the system? They meet many physicians. Again, these are ways that we feel that this solution, you can, you can extract, create a timeline, that's it. And you can literally just scroll through it if you'd like. Right? There's so many ways that you can use this now that you have an application like this. And that's uh, our service like this. And that's something we are truly excited about because you feel that allows um, a lot of our customers to do these things easily. And, and that's, that's what we're really aiming for. Now, let's go into medical coding. So the process of coding, and, and we all know the stats, right? I mean, ICD-9 to ICD-10 switch. So let's take the, um, the ICD-10 CM, the clinical modification codes, right? It went from 13,000, I think 13,000 to 69,000, right? That's not even including the procedural. I think overall, if you do that, it's like 17,000 to like 140,000 or something like that. I mean, that's crazy, right? There's more depth. So the thing is what that's interesting with the shift is there's a depth now. Now, when you, when you create something hierarchical, like similar to SNOMED or any other ontology like that, you need accuracy. It is extremely important. You get exactly what you need. But going also back to that, that, that process is complex, but how do you enable medical coders to work in different areas of a hospital? Because they're very specific to that area, but if you can deploy them in different ways, it, it becomes a lot uh, easier for you to improve coding efficiency, which is a huge need, but also reduce the burden. And I, I like uh, bringing that up a lot because in the end, we're really just trying to do that with this. We really just want to reduce the burden on the system and allow them to be effective in, in, in different ways that they're deploying. So clinical trial management, again, and you know, Identifying the right patients. I mean, if you look at uh, a patient that has come through maybe drug resistant, you know, uh, just say non small cell lung cancer, stage 3B, uh, you know, gemcitabine and cisplatin, taking Avastin, that's a lot of things to capture, and that's, that's a very hard search. Now, how do, you, how do you actually, you know, identify the right patients, but also more importantly, how do you identify the patients quickly? You know, there's, there's huge issues in clinical trials in the US where they're not able to find enough patients. And the process is insane. Like if you think about how, so as a, just say I'm a PI, I'm gonna annotate the patients I see. I'm only gonna focus on my area, I know what I do, I know how to annotate that. So you may create a pipeline there. But what if you could do it across? Right? How, how patients could be found, and, and all of us have had that kind of personal thing. We've gone to clinicaltrials.gov, we've looked at, you know, looked at the data, but how do you actually help you know, find patients for those clinical trials? I mean, that is a way that you can really accelerate the process. And, and if you look at the way that we're trying to apply the service and, and ingest, in, in general, our tenants, it's, it's, it's really focusing on that. How do we accelerate that? But even, even if you're looking at accurate indexing across large patient populations, there's a lot of data in clinical trials that are like just unstructured data that's created. How do you know how patients are doing? How do you know how they're going through therapy? See, oncology may be different because if you take a late stage of cancer, it's a, it may end up like with an immunotherapy in maybe six months, right? It may be a smaller trial, but how do you do it for the longer trials? How do you do even beyond that, right? And these are areas we feel that you can deploy um, Comprehend Medical very easy and get that data and, and put them into a clinical trial management system or anything like that to just accelerate this process. And there are different processes. There's different parts of a trial. And you know, as you go further along the trial, the population increases. It becomes a lot more complex. It's a lot of data. 
Now, pharmacovigilance, again, there's so many different avenues of reporting an adverse drug event or an adverse drug reaction. So again, it could be nurse calls, it could be emails, it could be faxes, it could be chats, it could be Facebook posts, it could be anything. Now, how do these teams actually go through this data? It's very manual. It's very manual, unless it's a nurse call and she transcribes it and then you capture it, right? So there's just a huge manual process here. Can we accelerate that? Yeah. What if, I mean, let me just you know, put this out there. What if you could create uh, an adverse drug event database post-launch immediately, where you essentially capture, you look at everything that's been extracted, you put it in a database, and as you go post you know, phase four of a trial, right, post-launch, actually create a corpus of what all the ADs could be. That, you can do that, you know, and those are things that really can help the ecosystem and push it further. And we see that as something again, you know, decreasing burden. If you there's a theme, right? I mean, simplicity of the of the of the API, um, kind of the areas that we're really use cases that we feel very passionate about and we're targeting, but also decreasing that burden on staff. Like in the end, like every if you've seen every slide on the on the right side, you know, we know that outcome can be imp improved with throughput, but how do we decrease that burden? And that's something that's really important to us. So PHI compliance. So this is again, you know, there's there's to maintain HIPAA compliance and the technical requirements for PHI as you know uh, information goes between systems is really difficult. Now you know there's data privacy. There's you know there's accurate ways, you know, of doing maybe PHI repository, but not accurate enough where you can actually point to the data and understand what is there. Then once you extract it, can you change things? Can you maybe resynthesize the data? Can you maybe accelerate moving that data to the cloud? Use SageMaker. Why not, right? I mean, there's so many different ways that you can now take it because you're able to deal with PHI in an effective way. And again, you know, whether you it's identifying or masking for data security, those are really you know important areas. And this is kind of like uh, I like to call those. Um, I don't say it's a boring use case, mundane case, but this is a bread and butter. This has to happen. And and when we created this um, service, that was something we needed to target right away because in the end, if we don't have that, everything else there's always going to be a question. So we feel very very confident and and, and really happy with how this service. Has has evolved, and again, we're following all the patient identifiers that are described in the HIPAA um, safe uh, method of safe, har safe harbor method of de-identification. Um, and, and truthfully, like any other AWS service, it's, it's truly just getting better. Um, and that's that's kind of again another tenet of the team: just keep improving, keep iterating, keep making it better, so you know our customers can make really really impactful solutions. So. Yeah. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew. Um, and very excited. Uh, you, know, you guys will love what he has, so I'll stop there. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Arun. Um, I get to talk to you a little bit about cancer research and cancer, which is not as much of a fun topic as many of the things that we've had to had the chance to talk about this conference, but. It's a very interesting time in cancer right now. The conversation is starting to shift. Over the last few years, because of advances in, in novel therapies, particularly the, the, the range of immunotherapies, so using a, a patient's own immune system that Arun uh, sort of referred to, uh, we've started to talk about curing cancer, not just treating cancer. And this is a, this is a tremendous shift for the industry. And the this has moved us into a period where we're really, really focused on time. It's not a question now of whether we can develop curative approaches to cancer, but when, how quickly. At the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center, where I come from, we've put a stake in the ground. We think this needs to be done by 2025. So what is it going to take to get us to 2025? Fred Hutch, for those that don't know, is a 43-year-old cancer research center based in Seattle, which together with our clinical partners, the University of Washington, Seattle Cancer Care Alliance, and the Seattle Children's Hospital, form the Seattle, uh, the Seattle Cancer Consortium. Fred Hutch is best known for having pioneered bone marrow transplant as a treatment for blood cancers. This was done decades ago. It earned a Nobel Prize, but more importantly, it saved upwards of a million lives globally so far. And we remain pioneers in this space of, of immunotherapy research. So we have our researchers that serve as physicians and our clinical partners. We drive clinical trials, and clinical trials is where I want to focus because this is how research gets to patients. And in the immunotherapy space, there's, there, 
things that are a little more complicated, where we're working to re-engineer a patient's own immune system, we have to, to have advanced laboratory processes to make this work. So let's talk a little bit about how, how we move from research into a therapy, into a, a, a medication that you can take. The process is pretty complex. So there's a period of research, sort of a general cartoon approach, basic science, discovery. The only way to translate that into clinical care is through clinical trials. And clinical trials are a very complex, uh, time-consuming process that is, is something that we are focused on. How can we make this part of the, of the pipeline go faster? And then finally, there's a regulatory approval phase to make sure that everything that we do is safe as uh, to the extent that um, uh, it is to the extent that we can make it so. Some things have happened in recent years. One is that we've actually gotten a little better on the research side. We've had new technologies that have come into the research side, genomics, single cell sequencing, advanced imaging. We've actually started to, to speed up the research engine to the point now where we actually have clinical trials that are, are pooled up, waiting to start. So why can't we start those? Why can't we move those into, into action so that we can bring these, the research into the clinic? And the answer is that clinical trials are hard. So if we look across the patient population, many patients, many cancer patients are being treated successfully by conventional therapies but many are not. And for those that are not, clinical trials are really the only option that most of these patients have. Today, it's estimated that about 5% of patients who should be on clinical trials are, are actually on clinical trials. So this is actually pretty tremendous. Think about how this slows research, not, not let alone how this impacts the individual patient. So clinical trials are just hard. When we start a clinical trial, trying to find the right patients takes time. It typically takes more time than we think it should. Most clinical trials actually fail to find enough patients. And this is a problem that just gets worse as we move into this era of precision medicine where where as we focus the therapies more and more, finding the specific patients that match to a clinical trial becomes harder and harder. And it turns out that a substantial number of clinical trials fail to enroll any patients at all. These may be trials that have therapies that would benefit not just individual patients, but, but broader, broader populations, and it's not happening. This is a, a young crowd here. This is interesting, but I'd like to invite you to, to take a look at your, your two nearest neighbors. So statistically, one of the three of you will be diagnosed with cancer in your lifetime. We have to make this engine go faster. So how do we make it go faster? Well, what's hard about clinical trials? Arun referred to this early on, is that most of the information that we need on the research side to identify patients, to understand what clinical trials are feasible, lives in unstructured text documents, in clinical notes, in the narrative that physicians and specialists create around a patient. The way we have access to this today is through clinical data experts who will sit and read through these notes. Um, in a recent uh, project that we did, we could read through with professional abstractors, people who spend their whole days doing this work, uh, took a few hours to go through a, a, a patient record. This was actually for a relatively simple condition. For some of the more precise in these immunotherapy clinical trials, the abstraction piece might be 24 hours, 36 hours, substantial amount of time. But in this case, a single abstractor can only look at three patients a day. 
We have tens of thousands of clinical trials that are waiting to start. It's been estimated that if we were to try to clear this backlog of clinical trials, and this is not just in cancer now, this is across, uh, across the whole space, that we would have to identify about a million patients. So even at this modest two and a half hours, it's about four million hours of abstraction, 500 years almost worth of abstraction, just to move forward the clinical trials that are, that are waiting today. So this is why we're really excited about Comprehend Medical. We now can start from the same place and with simple API calls, extract information specific about the patient, their disease, their treatment, their, the drugs that they've been taking, the dosage, regimen. All of this is the information that an abstractor needs in order to make the assessment of how to connect, how, how, to, how to understand the, the patient record and whether they can connect this to a particular clinical trial. This gives us, from the electronic medical record, a computable, more or less comprehensive view of the patient. So right now, from a research perspective, probably three quarters of the information that we're interested in is locked away in those clinical notes. But having a structured framework like this means that we can now search across patient population. It means that across our entire population, we can now surface these connections these similarities among patients to make the process of identifying what we call cohort selection. How do I identify the, the possible population of people that might participate in a clinical trial? Now we can do that much faster. So from our standpoint as a research organization, we take data from our clinical partners for research use, and we can now stream that through Comprehend Medical such that as we build our clinical research data warehouse, these data are now annotated. They carry all of this rich annotation that comes from Comprehend Medical, which gives us, gives our researchers the opportunity to interact much more directly and comprehensively with the data. If we just look at the annotation process, pulling out these specific entities, a really advanced uh, abstractor might be able to do a couple of notes an hour. In a recent study, that our pilot study that we did with, with Comprehend Medical, this is where we are. And of course, this is completely scalable. So this is removing an enormous and really unnecessary bottleneck today in this clinical trial process. This means that we can shift our focus from just those few patients that we can apply this very manual process of, of deep annotation and abstraction and look across the whole patient population, potentially connecting patients to life-saving clinical trials. This is really a question of time, both for researchers but really for patients. And something like Comprehend Medical gives us time that will help us get to our goal of 2025. So thank you very much. With that, I'd like to introduce uh, Anish from Roche Diagnostics. Thanks. Kajarwal. Hi, everybody. My name is Anish Kajarwal. I'll try it again. I, <laughs> I'm a director of a analytics engineering group in Roche Diagnostics Information Solutions. So for those of you who don't know Roche, Roche has uh, been around for 120 years and has, it's a leader in both pharmaceuticals and diagnostics. And as part of this, it's really a leader in looking at how to use science to really figure out how to treat patients better. One of the you know, key concepts that a lot of people talk about are things like decisions, clinical decision support or precision medicine. And really the idea here is how do you take all this information about a patient and use that as a way to figure out how to best treat the patient. 
and really arm physicians and care teams with all of this information so that they are, have the right, the right options in mind. As part of you know, Roche's strategy, we launched this platform, Navify Portfolio, Decision Support Portfolio, which really looks at how to, to enable physicians with this data and this information. When, when a patient has cancer, it's, you know, time is of the essence, as we were just hearing about. And really, you know, what a patient wants to hear about is that the physician has all the information at hand, that they can make these decisions quickly and that they're making sound judgments. And what we want to do is really build digital dashboards that bring all this information together, and we then build products on top of it to really enable physicians to understand this data. So one of the challenges at, in hospitals is that this patient information is distributed across a lot of different, different systems. So you could have data in electronic, electronic medical records, you can have radiological images, you can have laboratory information, you can have pathology reports, radiology reports, it's, it's so much different information. And this data is often siloed based on a particular specialty. So for you know, a physician, a care team to be able to look at this data, they often have to look at all these different systems. And then the other challenge is, as we've been talking about, a lot of this data is unstructured. So what we do as part of the, the Navify decision support portfolio is we build integrations with with hospital systems, we bring this data in, we standardize on things like fire, we bring this data into our, our platform, and we build these, these products to really enable care teams with you know, how to make these actionable insights and, and how to use analytics. So we've, talk, we've been talking about unstructured data, right? For us, one of the key things here is you know, how do we unlock all of this unstructural data so that we can have a comprehensive view of the patient. But not just a comprehensive view of the patient, but a view of the patient that really follows the patient over time. From the first time they come into the hospital, to the time they leave, to the time they come back, to you know, all the treatment decisions, all the medications that they've been given. We really need to be able to have this longitudinal view of the patient, and again, to be able to um, enable physicians to to understand the, the data the best. But as part of our Navify portfolio, we also have some additional challenges. So we are a, you know, we're running a multi-tenant platform that's distributed across the world. And as part of that, we have all these additional challenges with unstructured data. So we have these diverse set of customers distributed across. This means there's so many different languages that, that we need to support. We have all these, different diseases that we will be supporting. Right now we're focused on oncology, but with these different diseases means different terminologies. Each hospital, each specialty, they could have different report formats. Um, and all of these could be using different terminologies. And this makes um, this unstructured data and just healthcare data in general, a very um, challenging problem, but I'd also say a very interesting problem too. So here is a sample TCGA report. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, TCGA is the Cancer Genome Atlas, and this is a public data source. And it's a joint effort between the NCI and H HGRI. And it's really an amazing data set. So if you're not familiar with it, definitely recommend you look at it. And this here is a very, very simple report. There's, if you look at it, you'll see there's such a wide diversity of reports. You'll see reports with tables, you'll see reports with sections, key value pairs, it, it makes this whole problem very challenging. This is, like I said, this is, a, this is a very simple report, and it looks short. You see two paragraphs, but it's actually very densely populated with, with information. And you also see there's, of course, handwritten notes too, which makes things fun. So we had one of the, the data scientists on, on my team go through and really just annotate and curate it to, to see what, what's in there. And you can see a bunch of scribbling, and this is what you know, an abstractor might do, this is what a physician or a nurse might be doing in their head. And you can see there is a, there is a lot of information there. 
and there's these entities, the relationships between these entities, and you know, the, the current process is often to, to manually create this data. And that's obviously it's very time consuming, it's expensive, but it's also prone to error. Often you'll have to have multiple abstractors really look at this data to come up with some consensus. Here's what it would look like if you took that data and just really simply extracted the entities. And I would think you would agree this is a lot easier to, to manage. You now can look at this and you can understand the characteristics of the patient, the cancer, and really ultimately their diagnosis. So this is easier to understand, but not only that, this is something that could then be fed into the machine. And this is really important because this is really what you know, we can use as a way to surface in our products, and this is what we can use to, to power our analytics. So as we've been on this journey, um, our team really identified two needs, and I think it's obvious based on what I, I've said, but one, one need is NLP. So really, how do we unlock the structured data? But the key part here is just NLP, just general NLP isn't enough. This has to really be NLP that's specialized for medical data. It's been trained on medical data. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. You know, medical data is so, is so nuanced. The language is ultimately like a different language. And it's, it's a lot of work to have to train, you know, all these NLP models. The other part of this is a lot of these documents that we get, you know, sometimes we get, you know, nice just text that are physician notes, but often we get documents that are scanned and ultimately come to us as PDFs. And as I said before, there's a lot of tables and a lot of structure to it. So this is where we really look at how do we, how do we extract the data from these documents and make it machine readable, but also how do we retain that structure so that we can optimize NLP? Just pulling out the text kind of randomly, losing the structure is not sufficient. You really have to, to retain that structure. And we're uh, really excited to, to have this partnership with, with AWS, really excited to, to be here on stage. And really the timing of you know, both of these services, so Amazon's Comprehend, Comprehend Medical, um, that of course we're here talking about, and then the other one that I don't know if you guys know about was you know, Amazon's Text Extract, which is really what they're calling the OCR++. Service. It, these are perfectly timed as we kind of embark on this journey of how to, to unlock structured data. And you know, as we think about, as we thought about, you know, what are the what are the criteria for choosing this? You know, a lot of the a lot of the standard criteria. I think you know, all of you guys, you know, think about. You know, we obviously want things that are you know follow the the the, the applicable privacy laws, things like HIPAA. We want things that integrate well with AWS services. Another thing is we really love services that are serverless. That means we don't have to manage servers. Um, and then for us, scalability is a, is a big thing. You know, we're, as I said, we're, our platform is distributed across the world and we really need to be able to handle large volumes of these reports. Here's kind of a conceptual overview of how we are thinking about how these these services will really um, enable this data flow. So on the left, there's the, the hospitals, and on the right is really, you know, the, the kind of the databases and the analytics that would, that would really power the, the Navify portfolio. So if we take the, the simplest example, which is on the, the bottom there, really we're taking the machine-readable structure text that's coming from hospital EMR systems. We start that in S3, Hopefully we can do some pretty minimal processing of that and we can then stick it in a relational database like Aurora. We can make it searchable in something like Elasticsearch and we can do our analytics and machine learning and, and the various services. But then at the top, this is where you know, these services become really enabling. So how do we take something like scan documents or raw PDFs? So we would bring these in from the hospital, store them on S3. We would then want to apply text extraction on it to, to pull that information out. We would then store that extract, extracted text in the, in, while retaining the structure um, and store that on S3. And then we would run, an, run NLP, such as through Comprehend Medical, and then again, store that structured data now on S3. So now we have the structured data that came from, from these PDFs as well as the structured data that just came directly from the hospitals 
we can bring this information together and now we have a true, you know, comprehensive view of the patient that, that the physicians can use to, to really understand the patients and really um, know what are the options for best treating those patients. NLP it is really going to be a journey for us. It's, I think, it's not like we're just going to turn it on and all of a sudden everything just comes through automated. I, I think that's especially, you know, in this field where you can't, you know, have risks of data being incorrect, especially for what we're doing. So we're going to, we'll start with trying to automate as much as possible. We'll start out by, like, so right now, you know, physicians will be reviewing pathology reports. How can we make that easier? Then we'll focus on how can we extract entities and their entity relationships that really have high confidence. These would be things that, you know, we determine to be low-hanging fruit, things that have high confidence values. And we start to, start to automate it. And then as, as we gain more confidence, as we understand what the low-hanging fruit is, we will automate this more and more, bring this together, and we will then have more structured data, which ultimately improves our data quality, which we can then use to better enable clinical decision supports. I really appreciate you guys listening to me. I've enjoyed talking to you guys. And I think this is a hard, and I think it's a challenging problem. And if you'd like to join us on this journey of trying to solve it, please reach out to me. Go check out this website, and we'd love to have you part of it. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, you know, kind of call to action, this is uh, where you can find Comprehend Medical. Um, a blog was out about it as well, so please check that out. Uh, one thing I'd like to say, we're a very customer-obsessed team. So email me, ask me questions. We really want to work backwards from your needs and, uh, you know, really solve the hard problem. So feel free to reach out to me, and, you know, uh, we're, we're excited to talk to you guys. Also, please, uh, I think, uh, please complete the session survey <laughs> when you can. All right, we'll take, be taking questions off stage if you guys are interested. Thank you.